Now this question here is one that's so long, the question written out is so long that I'm going to have to go through it and then we'll refer back mentally to this slide as needed. Okay, so a student was asked to find a percentage of calcium carbonate in a sample of chalk. Okay, use chalk that were all at the same composition and mass 2.54 grams. Right there, that's an issue because uh, uh, what did he do? Cut the chalk bits of chalk up so they're exactly 2.54 grams each, or was it that a lump of chalk um, from the box was 2.54 grams? Not happy with that idea of three pieces of identical composition. Experimentally, what you do is you take three pieces that are close enough, do the reaction, and then average out your results. But anyway, this is A level, so they're all 2.54 grams. So we'll need that in a couple of slides time. HCl solution, concentration of 1, sodium hydroxide, concentration of 0.1. So use the burette to measure 50 cubic centimetres hydrochloric acid into a 100 cubic centimetre beaker. Put a reaction of chalk into the beaker and leave till the reaction finish. So in other words, the HCl is going to react with all of the calcium carbonate in the chalk. So after this reaction, you won't have any calcium carbonate left. You'll have any excess hydrochloric acid and then anything else that was in the chalk that wasn't calcium carbonate. So you filter it, add a few drops of indicator to the solution and titrate against the sodium hydroxide solution. So in other words, what we're titrating here with the sodium hydroxide is the hydrochloric acid that is left over. Anyway, repeat the procedure, calculate mean titer, use the mean titer to calculate percent of calcium carbonate in the chalk sample. OK, so remember what we're doing here. We're taking hydrochloric acid to react with all the calcium carbonate and then see how much of that hydrochloric acid is left afterwards. So how would the student know the reaction between the chalk and the acid had finished? So this is before we even do any titration, you just throw the chalk into the acid. Now, of course, what happens is acid plus carbon makes CO2, which means that the solution will bubble or effervesce. That's a good word as the reaction is happening. So the reaction ends when there's no more effervescence, i.e. bubbling. Suggest and explain two improvements to the student's method. Well, first thing is you always want to use a large enough container that you never ever have more than half of the container full. Because if you do, especially when you're getting bubbling going on here, that bubbling could go splash to the outside if you're doing a reaction in a fairly small container. So never be afraid to use a larger container. OK, um, you should rinse the beaker and add the washings to the flask. So that means that no acid is left into the beaker. Sure, you're diluting the acid, but that doesn't matter because what you're measuring with the titration is essentially the number of moles of acid left. So therefore, it doesn't matter as long as you don't rinse the beaker with hydrochloric acid. Of course, that'd be sort of silly. Use more acid, less chalk. Um, so uh, that will give you more to titrate afterwards. And a standard experimental consideration is that the bigger the quantity that you're measuring, the smaller the percentage error in just what you can't avoid in terms of error. So in other words, how pre precisely can you read the burette? Well, if you can read the burette to within 0.1 cubic centimeters and you're only measuring two cubic centimeters, 0.1 in two is a pretty significant 5% error. On the other hand, if you've got 20 instead of 0.1, then that becomes 0.05% error. So therefore, always try and get it so that you are measuring large amounts within reason, of course. Crust the chalk to make sure that the, um, the, the surface area that not only speeds up the reaction, but it also makes sure that there's no calcium carbonate left covered up by something that doesn't allow the acid to get to it. Heat the solution, stir it up, that speeds up the reaction. Um, yeah, you can do that. So now we'll get in to the results. So here's the equation. Notice the carbonate needs two H pluses in order to fully react because carbonate is two minus. So use this, the student's results, including the mean titer of 16.4 cubic centimeters to calculate the percent of calcium carbonate in the chalk solution. OK, so the original HCl, you might remember, was one moles per cubic decimeter and each student took 50 cubic centimeters of that. So the moles of HCl at the start is just the concentration times the volume, concentration times the volume in cubic decimeters, 0.05 moles of HCl. 
Then we did these titrations. Here's the actual results, giving us 16.4 cubic centimeters. That was calculated elsewhere. Um, and uh, this is titration using 0.1 moles per cubic decimeter of sodium hydroxide. So the moles of sodium hydroxide is the average volume, 16.4 cubic centimeters, cubic decimeters, times 0.1 moles of NaOH, which is 0 0.00164 moles of NaOH. Now remember, this NaOH is titrating the HCl that is left. So let's put all those together. 0 0.00164 moles of NaOH will neutralize 0 0.00164 moles of HCl. So therefore, the moles of HCl used up with a 0 0.05 minus the 0 0.00164 that were left. So therefore, the moles of calcium carbonate that were present is the moles of HCl. But remember, each calcium carbonate needs two moles of HCl. So therefore, the moles of calcium carbonate is the moles of HCl divided by two, which is 0 0.02418 moles of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, one of those lovely substances, the molar mass is pretty much 100, so 0 0.02418 moles of calcium carbonate weighs 2.418 2 grams of calcium carbonate. So we want the percentage of calcium carbonate in the chalk. If you remember back, each bit of chalk was 2.54 grams. So the percentage calcium carbonate is the 2.418 that we calculated from our titration divided by the 2.54 that was there originally times 100, which is 95.2%. Okay. Now, hopefully the, the lengthy way in which I was forced to go through this made sense to you. Ultimately, what was important was we took our chalk, the calcium carbonate, we added lots and lots of HCl to it so that the calcium carbonate was the limiting reactant. We knew that all the calcium carbonate was reacted up. We then determined by titration how much HCl was left, 0.0164 moles of the HCl, which we could then to determine how much HCl was used. That HCl was used in this reaction. That would give us the moles of calcium carbonate and then the grams of calcium carbonate, which we could then divide by the mass of chalk, multiply by 100 to get the overall percentage. So another fun titration question that starts with a relatively straightforward one. Acids could be considered to be strong or weak, concentrated or dilute. For an aqueous solution, explain the difference between the meanings of the terms weak acid and dilute acid. Okay, well, an acid is proton donor. So if we just write out the general expression, HA plus H2O, the acid donates the proton to the H2O, leaving behind H3O plus and A minus. Okay. Thus, we have an equilibrium established, which can be described in terms of a Ka. A weak acid is simply an acid that has a small equilibrium constant. You can have a 10 molar solution of HA or a 0.001 molar solution of HA. And if it's got a Ka, it is a weak acid. Dilute acid, however, can refer to any acid that just has a small concentration. So 0 0.001 molar HA, if HA has got a really little Ka, is a weak dilute acid, but 0 0.001 molar HCl would still be a dilute acid, but HCl completely dissociates, so it is a strong acid. So weak refers to the acid itself, dilute refers to how much of the acid you have in a particular solution. So grids opposite show titration curves for the addition of sodium hydroxide to 25 cubic centimeters of aqueous acid. From the list below, choose which acids were given curves A, which is here, and B, which is on the next slide, giving reasons for your answer. Well, let's look first of all at curve A. You can see that we start with an acid. We go up, we neutralize it going through the equivalence point, and then up here, we've got rid of all the acids. So every bit of base we add just makes the solution more basic. Various things to look for. First one is at the start of the reaction, there's no sudden rise. That would indicate that we have a strong acid. Okay. And then when we look at the equivalence point, this is halfway up that big surge, what we see is that the pH at that equivalence point is seven. Okay. Now, when you titrate a strong acid with a strong base, the equivalence point is pH of seven because there's nothing interesting left in the solution. 
if it was our strong acid HCl, then you'd have Cl minus left, or Cl minus is a spectator ion. And of course, NaOH, all the OH minus has been used up by the equivalence point, and you're left with Na plus, which is a spectator point, a spectator ion. So therefore, this equivalence point here, again, would imply that this is a strong acid being titrated with the NaOH. So we can eliminate Y and Z. Now, is it... 0.1 molar HCl or 0.001 molar HCl. Well, from that, we just think about what's the pH at the start. Before we add any NOH, pH is 1. So if the pH is 1, then the concentration of the acid is 0.1 molar. So that tells us that it is W. Now let's look at curve B, which hopefully you can see is quite a bit different. First of all, Look at that rise at the start. Remember, curve A started off nice and evenly. Curve B here, we've got an immediate rise at the start before it levels off. That implies a weak acid. Looking at the equivalence point halfway up the shooting up, it's over eight. OK, equivalence point pH less than or greater than seven tells you that this is a weak acid that is being titrated with a strong base. So we can eliminate W and X, and let's decide on the concentrations here. Well, the concentration at the start is less than three, okay? And so if the acid was Z, well then 0.001 molar, even if it was a strong acid, the pH would be three. As it's a weak acid, the pH would be greater than three. Thus, we must have Y, okay? Weak acid because of the rise, the equivalence point at greater than seven and the 0.1 molar as opposed to the 0.001 molar because the pH here at the start is three or just a bit less than three. And there is no way that 0.001 molar of a weak acid is going to have a pH of three. Which of the following indicators be most suitable for titration B? OK, well, there was titration B. Now, remember, the idea of an indicator is it's a weak acid where the acid and the conjugate base are different colors. And the pH range is the range at which it will change color. So it goes in whatever the color is for the acid comes out, whatever the color is for the base. And the pKa of the weak acid that is the indicator is smack in the middle of this range. OK, so if we look at what we want here, OK, we want any time you do a titration, you want the indicator to change color in this area here. So we've got the acid all nicely acidic and base all nicely basic. And you want the change in color to be around this shooting up area that encompasses the equivalence point. So if we think about methyl orange, that's going to change color over this area between 3.4 and sort of 4.8. So that's coming way too early. Chlorophenol red is between about 4.8, so starting there and 6.4. Starts to knock into this bit, but still too early. Thymol blue, smack where we want it. And brilliant cresyl blue, which might be brilliant, but it's not what we want right here because that's changing color well past the equivalence point. So the one we want is thymol blue because its color change encompasses this big equivalence point jump. Now calculate concentration of sodium hydroxide solution used in titration A. We decided that titration A was 0.1 molar HCl. And if you remember, we had 25 cubic centimeters or 25 milliliters of it. So therefore the moles of HCl were 0.0025 moles of HCl. And that's what we had here. And we added NaOH, which is going to neutralize some of the HCl, 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 shoot up here past the equivalence point, at which point it has neutralized all the HCl. And then as we add a bit more, all that's there in solution is the basic OH minus. Okay. So therefore, that means that if we had 0 0.0025 moles of HCl, at this equivalence point here, we had added 0 0.0025 moles of NaOH. And to get there, we needed 30 cubic centimeters. So therefore, the concentration of the sodium hydroxide is the moles of sodium hydroxide that we got because we knew the moles of HCl, divided by the volume of sodium hydroxide that we needed to get to this equivalence point, And that is equal to 0 0.083 molar.
Finally, throw this in here, similar question that we've had before, but we might as well go through it. Aqueous ammonia we can react with hydrochloric acid to form the salt ammonium chloride. Why is the pH value for ammonium chloride less than seven? Well, NH4Cl is of course a soluble ionic compound, which means in solution it's NH4 plus and Cl minus. Cl minus is the conjugate base of a strong acid, so it's a spectator ion. While it's a base, it's so weakly basic, we can ignore it. NH4 plus, however, is a cation. It will react with water to reversibly give H3O plus, thus this is an acid, plus the conjugate base NH3. So we have NH4 plus in there. Some of that will give us H3O plus, which is, of course, acidic, less than 7 pH. So question 13, part of a longer question, but we'll throw in the easy parts at the start just to emphasize the redundancy associated with the A levels. So ammonia is a weak base. What's a weak base? Well, a base is a proton acceptor. Base plus water accepts a proton from the water, giving us BH plus, leaving behind OH minus. It's the OH minus that, of course, affects the pH in the solution. And simply a weak base is one that has a small equilibrium constant for this reaction. You can describe that as partially reacts or dissociates because a strong base, of course, it goes all the way. Weak base sets up an equilibrium because it has a smaller equilibrium constant for this reaction. Now talk about buffer solution, ammonia, ammonium chloride. Explain what's meant by a buffer solution, show how it can act as a buffer solution. Discussed this in a previous movie. What you need to have for a buffer solution is a acid and its conjugate base. In this case, NH4 plus is the acid, ammonia is the conjugate base, in close to a one to one ratio. If we add acid, strong acid to this solution, it will react with the ammonia. So it will remove some of the ammonia for it in order to re-establish equilibrium. The reaction will move to the left, which uses up a teeny little bit of the OH minus, but not nearly as much as would have been used up if you didn't have the ammonia there to start with to do the neutralization. Same idea if we add a strong base. Strong base gets neutralized by an acid. We've got NH4+. Plus. We remove some of that NH4 plus, we get rid of all the added OH minus. Now the equilibrium will re-establish, moving a little bit to the right, generating a teeny little bit of OH minus, but not nearly as much as was added in the first place. So because you have in a buffer solution an acid and a base, if you add base or acid to it, the components of the buffer solution will react with the acid base or acid to reduce the effect on the pH. So a big reason for including this question at this stage in the worksheet is because it's a titration. pH curve titration of a solution of ammonia. It's hydrochloric acid in equal concentration given below. So we start off with ammonia, weak base, nice high pH. Start adding the HCl. Um, initially a sharp decrease, but then it levels out because, of course, every bit of ammonia that we neutralize turns into its conjugate acid ammonium. So we have ammonia and ammonium here. This is in the buffer. Then we don't have enough ammonia left anymore. Shoot down through through the equivalence point at which all that's left is the conjugate acid and then keep adding HCl. So we keep adding some H plus. So the pH just gets lower and lower and lower. So first question, calculate Ka for the ammonium ion. Well, there is the equivalence point at which all we have is the ammonium ion. But the important bit here is not the equivalence point pH, but the volume of the equivalence point from which we get the volume of the half equivalence point. So the equivalence point is about 20 mils of the HCl. So the half equivalence point about 10 mils. At the half equivalence point, the pH is the pKa, whatever acid you've got in there. OK, there we go along there, up to there. And we say the pH is about 9.3. And that's equal to the pKa of ammonium because that's the acid that we have. So if the pKa is 9.3, the Ka is 10 to the minus 9.3, which is 5 times 10 to the minus 10. Now we want to pick an appropriate indicator for the titration from the list below. 
Well, you want the indicator to change color around the equivalence point so that the color of the solution is one color up here and then another color down there. So the change needs to be here. If we look at what we've got there, bromothymol blue between 6 and 7.6. Okay, so it starts to change a smidge early. 4 nitrophenol between 5 and 7, so that's there. We'll look at that. That encompasses the equivalence point beautifully, so that looks pretty much spot on. Methyl yellow, 2.9 to 4.0. Well, that's 2.9, that's 4.0. By the time it changes color, the equivalence point is well past, so it's a bit late. And phenolphthalein, the classic one, you want to change between 8.2 and 10. Phenolphthalein is a great one for when you're titrating a weak acid with a strong base. It's a really lousy one for a weak base with a strong acid because the color change is way too early. So for nitrophenol, changing between 5 and 7 looks like it encompasses the equivalence point quite nicely. So again, nice long question. Oxalic acid may be analyzed using titrations. pH curve for the solution is given below. Before I go any further, let's just point out that what you've got here is not one, but two equivalence points. So let's remember that in a second. We've got various Alice, Brychan, Keris, and David use different ways to do the titration. And in a minute, we're going to explain which of these methods will allow students to get a valid day to calculate the concentration of oxalic acid. But first of all, why does oxalic acid have a curve of this shape? Well, the first thing is it's a diprotic acid, H2A, because we have two equivalence points. This is for the first one going. This is for the second one going. So we start off and before we add any NaOH, all we got in here is H2A. So that's what's right here, starting off at a nice low pH. Initial little bump, and then it levels off as we make the buffer area, because this is where we're neutralizing the H2A, removing one of the protons to make its first conjugate base. So in here, we've got a buffer solution where we have the acid and its conjugate base. Keep adding the OH minus, and you get up to where you've got none of this left. All of this has been turned into HA minus, and that's what's there at the first equivalent point. But HA minus, of course, has this H here. It's a diprotic acid, so this H is also acidic. So we keep adding the OH minus, and now instead of neutralizing the H2A, because there's none of this left, it starts picking on the HA minus. So you neutralize HA minus, you get the second conjugate base, A2 minus, and this area here is a buffer solution because you've got a nice close to equal amounts of the HA minus, which here is an acid and its conjugate base, A2 minus. Keep on adding this though, and eventually you've reacted all of the HA minus. It's all turned into A2 minus, which is what is present at this equivalence point. And then you keep adding OH minus, and it just makes the pH more and more basic. Now we want to talk about the different titrations. So Alice used the pH probe to measure the pH after addition of each bit of sodium hydroxide solution. That's the best method. That's how you get this pretty little curve. You can see exactly the volume of the equivalence point, the first one there, the second one there, and move on. Brychan used phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein changes pH between 8.2 and 10. So there it is there. It changes color for the second equivalence point. And of course, if you know the volume of the second equivalence point, you can get the volume of the first equivalence point and do both titrations. But you're only actually getting one of those values directly. Let's think about Keras used methyl orange, which changes 3.2 to 4.4. Well, there we are. That's the color change area of methyl orange. So that would give Keras the volume for the first equivalence point, which she could double to get the volume for the second equivalence point. But again, she's only measuring one of the two values. Then we come to poor David using Cresol Red. Cresol Red changes 1.8 to 2.8 right there way too early. So David wouldn't observe anything. Keris and Brychan would get one of the two possible values, but Alice could determine both of the possible values. 